Welcome to our Sunday School class here at St. James Episcopal Church in Leesburg, Florida. We're going through a program called The Faith We Confess, a look at the 39 Articles of Religion. The 39 Articles are our classical statement of faith uh, produced by the Church of England during the English Reformation in the 16th century, ratified under the time of Queen Elizabeth I. And so today, on this Pentecost Sunday, we are looking at Article 5, which is of the Holy Ghost. So let's take a look at what Article 5 says here about the Holy Ghost. Well, it's just one sentence, but there's a lot in that one sentence. Article 5 of the Holy Ghost says, The Holy Ghost, proceeding from the Father and the Son, is of one substance, majesty, and glory with the Father and the Son, very and eternal God. So that's one uh, statement, but a lot in that statement to unpack. So let me just uh, break it down for you. Uh, some key points that this article states about the Holy Ghost, or as we would say, the Holy Spirit. There are really three key points. The one uh, first is that the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and the Son. That is, the Holy Ghost is distinct from the Father and the Son and proceeds from both the Father and the Son. And uh, that's something I'll uh, touch base on in just a moment. The second is that the Holy Ghost is of one substance, majesty, and glory with the Father and the Son. So the Holy uh, Ghost is distinct from the Father and the Son, proceeds from the Father and the Son, but is also of the same substance or essence or being with the Father and the Son and has the same glory and majesty as the Father and the Son, which therefore means that the Holy Ghost is also very and eternal God. The Holy Ghost is God just as much as God the Father is and God the Son is. Well, this is a positive uh, statement of faith about the person of the Holy Spirit, but it's also meant to correct some common misunderstandings that have emerged about the Holy Spirit over the centuries, and many of which remain uh, to this day among various groups. And here are some of those misunderstandings. One is that the Holy Spirit is an impersonal force that emanates from God, that the Holy Spirit is not God, and uh, that it's not personal. It's simply a force uh, that goes out into the universe. But the article states clearly that the Holy Spirit is God, and the Holy Spirit is a person. Another misconception is that the Holy Spirit is perhaps a high-ranking angel or perhaps a lesser deity created by God the Father at some point in time. This is uh, the same misconception that many have had about the person of Jesus, that he might have been a high-ranking angel or some deity that God created. Same misunderstanding that has emerged about the Holy Spirit. And then finally, the misconception that the Holy Spirit lacks his own personhood. Perhaps that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God, but not a person distinct within God's very uh, uh, eternal uh, being. And uh, that's clearly not the case. Uh, Article 5 makes it clear that the Holy Spirit is his own person uh, within the Godhead. Well, our statement of uh, faith about the Holy Spirit uh, must come from Scripture because our faith is scriptural. And there are lots of scriptures about the Holy Spirit that we could uh, uh, talk about, but I certainly wouldn't have time to do that in the next few minutes. So I'm just going to touch on uh, just six of them, two from the Old Testament, four from the New Testament. So let's look at the first one here. And uh, the first one is the very first uh, verses from the Bible in the opening verses of Genesis. Here it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And so here we see that the Holy Spirit, eternal with God, was present with uh, God the Father at the very beginning of this world's creation, and was actually doing the work of forming this world uh, amidst the darkness and the void, the, the Holy Spirit hovering over the face of the waters, bringing form to it, uh, bringing order into this world that we have. 
And then here, this very important passage in Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 3, we see the importance of the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our world today. Isaiah says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. So we see that the Holy Spirit uh, was key in the formation of our world and is also key in the restoration of our world, bringing good news to the oppressed and uh, setting the, the captives free, releasing prisoners and comforting those who mourn. Jesus said when he began his public ministry that this passage from Isaiah was fulfilled in him, that he was the one through the work of the Holy Spirit who would accomplish this final restoration in our world. And now we have access through our faith in Christ to that same Holy Spirit within us to bring about this work of restoration, to bring the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. And that is very much badly needed uh, in our day, something that we as followers of Christ need to make a, a use of this anointing we have uh, from the Holy Spirit to bring restoration. Just think about what's happened uh, just in this past week with this terrible uh, tragedy, this injustice that was uh, done to George Floyd in uh, Minneapolis and the, the anger that has uh, arisen uh, from it, the just anger over his death, but also the rioting and the violence. How important it is for us as followers of Christ uh, to be these agents of restoration uh, to bring liberty, but also to comfort those who mourn, uh, to bring peace where there is violence uh, in this world, and uh, that we are called upon to uh, do that through the presence of the anointing of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Well, jumping over to the New Testament here in Matthew chapter 3, we see Jesus uh, when he is baptized, and it says, when he had been baptized, Jesus came up and immediately uh, from the water, beheld the heavens uh, open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. Here again, we see the uniqueness of the Holy Spirit and its identity coming upon him as a dove out from heaven, sent from God the Father, resting upon Jesus and anointing him for this ministry of restoration of our world. Well, when we uh, jump over now to John chapter 15, Jesus teaches his disciples more specifically about the uh, identity and the work of the Holy Spirit uh, in their lives. He is about to depart from them. He's about to be crucified and then he's going to rise from the dead and eventually he's going to leave them, but he's going to send the Holy Spirit. And he says, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. Here we can see why many people uh, mistakenly think that the Holy Spirit lacks his own personhood, because the Holy Spirit doesn't glorify himself or speak of himself. Instead, Jesus says that he doesn't speak on his own authority. Whatever he hears, he will speak, and uh, that he will testify of me. And so the Holy Spirit specifically uh, glorifies uh, Christ in our lives and in our world in doing this work of uh, ministry of restoration. Uh, he also tells us things to come. That doesn't necessarily mean that we are to know everything that is to happen in the future in front of us. But we know that what is to come is ultimately going to be our salvation, and that helps us prepare for the things that are to come. Well, here now in John chapter 20, this is Jesus on the day of his resurrection on Easter Sunday here uh, with his disciples, and uh, he comes and speaks to them. And here it says, Jesus said to them again, 
peace be to you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Uh, this has uh, been perplexing for a number uh, of reasons, uh, but um, in essence, what Jesus is saying is that through the, the reception of the Holy Spirit, the, the disciples are now empowered to share the message of Jesus' forgiveness to the world, uh, and that that forgiveness has a real impact because of what Jesus has done. But it does require reception on those who hear the message. And so if they receive the message, then, uh, then uh, their sins will be forgiven them. They can proclaim that their sins are forgiven, but uh, if they reject it, then, then you proclaim that their sins are retained because the restoration is there to be received, but it requires our willingness to receive it. And we are commissioned to share that message through the reception and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And finally here, uh, on this day of Pentecost, this verse from Acts chapter 2 being particularly appropriate, uh, the, this is Peter speaking on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit had descended upon the disciples, and he stood up and proclaimed to them the message of Christ and his death and resurrection and his uh, ascension into heaven. And so here he says, Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. And so this pouring out of the Holy Spirit, because Jesus has gone up and ascended into heaven in majesty, now we have access to the Holy Spirit uh, and to share the gospel with uh, the rest of the world and to do so uh, in a powerful way. Well, again, as, uh, as we stated, uh, our faith is a creedal faith. It's, it's a matter of a, a statement of faith about what we believe about God and about Jesus and of the Holy Spirit. And uh, it has been a creedal faith from the beginning. And uh, the, the, perhaps the central creed of our faith is the Nicene Creed, uh, which was uh, formulated in the fourth century. And there is a section in the Nicene Creed about the Holy Spirit. And what does it say? It says, we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. And so this is where we get our language of Article 5 of the Holy Ghost about the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son, drawn from the language of Scripture, uh, what we've seen uh, in these passages, particularly the Gospel of John. But uh, an interesting question uh, needs to be addressed about that. And the question is, uh, is that what the Nicene Creed originally said about the Holy Spirit when it was written in the fourth century? And uh, interestingly enough, the answer is no. The original version of the Nicene Creed only stated that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. And the additional phrase, and the Son, which in Latin is filioque, was actually added 200 years later in the Council of Toledo, Spain in the year 589. Well, you might say, well, that's, that's interesting, but does that really matter? Well, simply as a matter of history, yes, it does matter because the Latin church in the West, in Rome, and the Greek church in the East, in Constantinople, could not come to agreement over which phrase should be in the creed, and that contributed to their eventual schism, or schism in the year 1054, which remains between the uh, Western Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church to this day. Now, the Eastern Orthodox Church saw the Holy Spirit as proceeding from the Father alone, because the Father is considered to be the fountain of deity from which the Son and the Spirit derive their divinity. The Son and the Spirit are God just as much as the Father is God, but uh, they want, it to, uh, want us to see that the Father still is a fountain of deity from which the Son and the Spirit derive their divinity uh, in an eternal relationship, but still they derive their divinity from the Father. And the Orthodox Church also views the Son's possession of the Spirit as an act of God's grace. 
that is the spirit proceeds from the father and rests upon the son as he did at jesus baptism so uh, it's an act of god's grace uh, in our world today this uh, jesus receives the the spirit uh, from the father the uh, who who possesses out from the father and jesus possesses the spirit and then pours it out upon us and that's actually the language that you see in the book of acts when peter talks about jesus being ascended and receiving the promise of the Father in pouring it out. And uh, the Orthodox Church says that's how we should understand the relationship of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But the Western Catholic Church says there's uh, a, another way we should look at it, and that is we should see the Holy Spirit's procession from the Father and the Son as an eternal relationship between the persons of the Trinity, not just a temporal one. If that were not the case, uh, the argument would be that there could be no reciprocal relationship between the persons because the procession would only go out in one direction, outward from the Father, but it can't go back from the Son and the Holy Spirit back to the Father if it's not an eternal reciprocal relationship. And so that's why it would be necessary for the Holy Spirit to proceed from the Father and the Son. And so in the Western Church, the Son is considered eternally begotten from the Father, while the Holy Spirit eternally proceeds from both the Father and the Son. And so the Church of England clearly sided with the Western Church on this doctrine, as did the main Protestant denominations. And that's why Article 5 says that the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and the Son. And that's why we have it in our version of the Nicene Creed. Well, is there a good uh, line of argument uh, uh, to uh, really consider why the Holy Spirit should be seen as proceeding from both the Father and the Son? Well, here it might be uh, uh, good to look at a line of argument from the Church Father Augustine of Hippo from uh, the late 4th century and the early 5th century, one of the great greatest theologians in Church history. He wrote a, a, a book called On the Trinity, uh, describing the relationship between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And one of his lines of arguments goes this way. Scripture says that God is love. And so we understand and agree that God is love. 1 John 4, 8 tells us that. But how can God be love if he does not have anyone to love? Whom did God love before he created anything? Well, it must mean that God, therefore, uh, is in an eternal relationship within himself. And so what Augustine of Hippo said is, Now, when I, who am asking about this, love anything, there are three things present, I myself, what I love, and love itself. For I cannot love love unless I love a lover. For there is no love where nothing is loved. So there are three things, the lover, the loved, and love. And so Augustine of Hippo would say that the lover is God the Father, the loved is God the Son, and the Holy Spirit is love, and that these must proceed, uh, this relationship must be a reciprocal one. So the Holy Spirit would proceed back and forth in a reciprocal relationship between the Father and the Son uh, throughout all eternity. So then some questions to consider. Do you think it makes a difference to believe that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son or from the Father alone? And what exactly do we need to know about the Holy Spirit? And finally, is it more important to experience the Holy Spirit than to understand the Holy Spirit? Well, if you have any questions about this article or any of the articles and uh, you would like me to address them, feel free to email me. My email address is fathertrees at stjames-leesburg.org. Until then, you have a blessed Pentecost Sunday.